Monday morning came really quick. I don't know why I decided to work this weekend on this thing. Cause yeah, we got a we got, we have a new class this week, and yeah, yeah, I'll catch you up on that later. But remember that thing I said right at the end of the last video. Is really uh, what I have left to test. Uh, I gotta gotta test the motor, but I assume the motor works. I tried to start up my motor, and it ran for like a half a second, and I got a trip warning. Yes, and I know, folks, I don't actually need the E300 because I have the PowerFlex 525. But remember, part of the purpose of this trainer is to sprinkle different things you'll see out in the field. So you will see motors that have drives, but you'll also see motors that have basic overloads. And the other one had a really basic overload and had a remote trip on it that I could use to trip it. But this time I wanted to show how we could also do some current monitoring. Now, I... um. You know, I've assigned IP addresses to the 300s. In fact, uh, you know, you know, where on the uh, SIM IPE, you can do the uh, the really fast assigning IP address. Where if you got a good rhythm, you can probably assign each IP address in like five seconds. That came from somebody who needed to set like 200 E300 overloads. I don't know how to set an IP address. Apparently, I don't know how to configure one of them. My my wild guess is that it defaults to zero amps. And I need to go figure out how to set it up. Also, I had a thought on that swap byte. If you recall yesterday, I was on this pump monitoring code, and really at the end of the evening, I realized uh, I'm definitely having a swap byte issue, which we had noticed on a lot of it. And like in the case of this banner stack light, it had the swap byte feature right here. So I was able to fix it really quick. But this one doesn't have it. But I got thinking about it. There is some swap features on the Turk module itself. So right here, we have our process input and it defaults to swap 16. So what I'm gonna to try to do, well, first of all, I'm, I don't know anything better to do, but let's just try direct. So we're gonna write that parameter. And mainly our temperature ought to be somewhere in the 20th range. There we go. So, that was an easy way to fix that swap. So, wow. Good job, Turk. The next, I want to see if I can get that overload working. So, let's go to controller tags. And we'll go up here and type overload in. And I guess we would tell this what amps to run. Okay, and it isn't there. Somebody out there might have to tell me how to do this. Let's see, we'll go over to I.O. configuration. And we'll hit the overload there. Okay, and overload protection. Actually, the default still, well, trip class 10, that, that, could be a little bit of an issue, but um, 0.5 full load amps doesn't sound bad. Huh. All right, I'm probably going to have to break out the instructions to figure out how to set this up. Which may or may not happen because, yeah, I got to get this place cleaned up for training. So let me get cleaning, and then maybe we can get back to that. Just realized I got my solenoids backwards. This one is supposed to go up here. This one uh, 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 needs to get down there, so we're going to break out the wire stretcher. Okay, well, my wire stretcher, got it in there. Not super happy with the way this looks. Anybody got any tips? Let me zoom out a little bit. Yeah, really, I need these two M12s coming down here, but I don't really have anything to hold them there. I need to formalize that somehow. I remember yesterday, uh, <laughs> this one cable let me hanging out to dry. Well, nope, I gotta give my distributor credit. They gave me every cable I needed. I just couldn't find it in the pig pen that I had surrounding the machine yesterday. I've wired this uh, safety switch absolutely every way that you can, upside down and everything else. And still can't get my inputs to turn on and off. And so I finally broke out the voltmeter, which I should have done quite a while ago. And yeah, when I stick it into that terminal and I close it up, then we have 24 volt on both of them. 
And if you watched yesterday's video, I even said, so I'm gonna go up here to number three. And if we go to its input points, then yeah, this one is configured. Oops, well, we're gonna need those configured soon. But I never actually went over there and did it. So if we go over here to our IB8S, and we go down to our input points, and then yeah, I never went back, even though I sat there and said, I'm gonna need to do these. I need to set these up, both as safety. We can hit our apply button. Get ourselves a couple of little scary warnings. And now my door's open, no indicator. I shut my door, I have my indicator. So two days in a row, <laughs> the same thing got me, so it never ends. But yeah, so I added this switch here because a lot of you said that I needed to talk about mutant, or mutant. Yeah, y'all said I need to talk about mutants in the industry and the growing powers that they have. Muting safety applications. So this one will be, I'm not exactly sure how I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna have to give my buddy Jeff Kuiper. He's gonna have to nail it down for me. But it'll probably be that when you open the door, either maybe the fan can't run. Well, although we have it blocked off where you can't get your hand in it. Maybe we'll make it where it looks like you get your hand in it or something. And when when you can run, it'll, or when you have it closed, it'll let everything happen. So yeah, this'll be hopefully for us to do an example of a muting application. I have to give Michael mad props on this, even if we don't have the indicator I was asking about. He made this where it would not crash if you ran it too far because apparently I did not set the limits. It should be a nice slow 90 degree. And I press the button. That seems like way more than 90 degrees. And of course, just like a real plant, I don't have a backup of it. So I'm going to plug into the old one. Now controller to the PC, COM4, okay. File train, oops, I gotta do that again. So I'm gonna call this my YRGTS. And we'll hit a save, okay. Now I should be able to plug into the new one. And of course, twist the round connector and just keep shoving instead of actually looking at the locator pin. Click OK, and now we're gonna transfer, whoops, gravity's not on my side leaning against this panel apparently. And select COM4, go grab that same file. And, oh. Okay, don't, don't y'all act like you wouldn't do the exact same thing. Yeah, I pulled the parameters out of the other one. I put them into this one. And now I have an insanely angry servo controller because I also downloaded the uh, IP address of that machine down there, that one over to it, which means it has a duplicate IP address now. So it was supposed to be 103. And I come over here and yeah, I uh, put 26 into it along with all that. So we'll put it back to 103. Hit okay. Yes, says I need to restart the controller. And then, yeah, I definitely need to save over that. Okay, now I press the button. Oh, yeah, that looks a little more like that valve switch to jog. So now I need to do a little bit of homing, and we should be set. Okay, on well, this one, home is straight up and down. So one, if I try to open it any further now, nope, not going anywhere. I try to close it. Oh yeah, I can admit Michael did a really good job on this. And stops, now we can open it back up. Sweet. Looks like Michael's got a little bit of tweaking to do to his mount because retract works fine, but when I bring that slide gate down, it's kicking that mount back just a little bit. So I had to jump off for a crazy unplanned learning opportunity. Output four right here on our trainer tells us that we're connected to the drive and the drive has a nice dr steady dropping out. And so, yeah, we, we uh, found a nice um, learning opportunity in the latest version of Connected Components Workbench, but got it fixed. We're still gonna ship.
Which the final check before the trainers go out is this right here actually reads that we have a micro 50 set up to read what's set up on the trainer. So this one has the PowerFlex 525. It also actually has an 850 on it and it has the Ethernet switch. So when I plug into it, if everything's right, yep, it's a TRN ICP micro 850. So just like a typical work site, you get pulled off of things and I, I'm back on and I really want to figure this E300 out. It's kind of baffling me. So I'm digging into the tags here and I found the overload colon I protection and we open it up and it is an overcurrent. It is a phase loss trip. So maybe I lost a phase, but I don't believe so. So according to the manual, the phase loss is when the load transitions from zero amps to 30 amps of the minimum FLA sample or setting of the device. Now, I have control left all the way through this thing and I can't find anything about where to set the minimum of it. Now this is a five amp current since an E300 because I think that was the lowest one it could get and we have like a 0.1 amp load on it because it is mostly for looks. So 30% would be three amps. So we may not be able to do that phase loss. So we're gonna go over here into module properties and I found the enable phase loss. I'm going to uncheck that for now. We'll hit apply on that, get a couple of scary warnings and reset my E300. And now, ooh, 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 it'll run now. So I think we may have choked off our airflow too much on this one. So how this is supposed to work is you are blowing air into here and it pressurizes the chamber and that launches this ball up and then we can do some cool PID stuff here. But I put the motor wide open. And that ball ain't moving. All right, I really didn't know it was gonna be this difficult to blow a ping pong ball around, uh, but I, I, I'm, I'm down to almost my last uh, straw. Uh, I took the side gate completely out of it. Uh, the encoder's off the front of us here. Literally, you can stick your finger all the way through it now, and it still won't blow the ping pong ball up. But I was looking at this one over here, and it actually, it, it raises it up a little bit and there's a really tight opening around it on this one. And this ball was sitting down at a pocket that was a little lower. So I just stuck a screw in here. That way it can't go all the way down. And now if I hit the buttons. Whoa. Well, there you go. They're gonna get it all back together almost exactly like it was, except for the balls raised up a little bit. Same as every controls job we're ever on, we gotta go behind the mechanical people and take all their stuff apart and make it work. And if karma didn't get me right after I said that, uh, I don't know how I did this. Uh, here's a classic one. This is a PMP sensor. This is an MPN sensor. I have no idea how it, ended up doing that but yeah as I was moving these around to test this one works perfectly fine is it right here I couldn't get a light on and of course I well well I, well, I can't get a light on it now because I took it loose but of course I took every wire part on that circuit metered it all out and then finally looked at the sensor part number and realized oh yeah we had, that NPN sensor is not gonna work that knocks out all my IO testing really not too bad uh, I have one sensor that I got it. I grabbed an MPN sensor instead of PMP, and I've looked around. I don't have another one unless I steal it off of the other machine trainer. The cable's a little short on that, and that's not going to be a total showstopper. We can keep starting to test the functionality with it, but I want to stress one thing here at the end of this, uh, and that's about forces and toggling bits. I have fully tested this out, and I never forced anything. I never toggled anything. And, you know, people come to my class and, you know, that's immediately the first thing they want to do is, well, try to toggle and see if it works. Well, let's force it and see if it works. No, no, no. That's that's not how we do things. In fact, I, Rock, will y'all just end service edition? It really, yeah, it just stinks. But 
really, if you need to have a way to test things, you write it into your program. If something's not working, you grab your meter. And I'll be honest, I don't think I could have done it any faster with either a force or a toggle, anything I've done on this. And yeah, it's just a very dangerous, bad habit to get into. Now, if you go into my class, I'll tell you a story, really. I, um, one of my friends, I mean, his career was cut way short through a really simple mistake using forces. And that's what I want to keep you out of. So if we need to operate something, let's put some HOAs on it. Let's make ways to manually operate our equipment safely. Well, that's it for today. Uh, next one, I guess I need to start uh, seeing if I can get my PID tuned and start getting the ball balanced in the tube.